Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening. This is Dr. McSherry and Dr. Brooke Davidson. It is 8.03 p.m. on April 21, 2014. Tonight we're going to be evaluating and critiquing two case lists. Uh, Dr. Um, I think it's uh, Poor Sharif and Dr. Emily Thompson. So Dr. Poor Sharif and Dr. Emily Thompson. And I see Dr. Poor Sharif is here, so I'm going to go ahead and take him off of mute. Hi, Dr. Poor Sharif. Are you there? Okay, um, we don't hear him, but I'm going to go ahead and pull his case list up anyway, Brooke, okay? okay. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, yeah. can hear you, uh, yep, yep. Hi, how are you? Perfect, thank you. All right, let's put your list up first. Okay, Brooke, do you want to start with the OB list? And, um, sure. and you can just let me um, know what you feel that is, and then I can just moderate and go ahead, Brooke. Okay. So your first case with mild preeclampsia breach, um, you could just do preeclampsia and let them ask you whether it was mild or severe, or you could leave the mild, that's fine, um, and then breach, and then under your, so then under your procedures, okay, postpartum will be none, or so you did an external cephalic version, induction of labor, SVD, stay in the hospital for three days. Um, perinatal death, you want to make sure that you put an N there, and then the okay. date looks up, looks a little small, right? Yeah. Um, but okay. so that actually, that looks good. That actually, that looks Thank good. You. Good. Brooke, you're, you're, Brooke you're, going in and, you're going in and out. I don't know what's going Are you on a, like a cordless phone or a cell phone? No. Oh, because, okay. I'm going okay. in and out, really? Yeah, you were, you were going in and out for a second, so um, okay. go ahead. Keep on going. All right, then your next three cases all have choreo, which is fine. Um, and they all end up with vaginal deliveries. So do you have anyone that ended up with a C-section or something that might have just been a little bit different? Because essentially there are three cases that are pretty much all the same. The same. I probably have some choreo uh, in other categories as different, uh, maybe in like primary C-section or in some other parts, but I have to look uh, into that. And if it's the... probably better to have three people with choreo all deliver vaginally, but just for just a little breath, a little further breath. Right. Of cases. Sure. Um, and again, as Dr. McSherry said, you could just write antibiotics and then let them ask you which antibiotics you gave. Okay. Um, but essentially, they all got amp and gent, they all had vaginal deliveries, all had good APGARs, stayed in the hospital. Um, now, they all stayed in the hospital for three days. So is that including the days that they were in labor? Yes, I included that also. I, I understand. Uh, I think Linda was staying in the hospital for me for my cases a little bit long, uh, but I also included the if like if they were induced, I induced. Uh, I included the induction uh, days, also delivery days. You know, so that's right. why they're a little what bit longer. Yeah. What are we telling people these days to have? Is it supposed to be the entire time they're in the hospital for the days in the hospital and prior? Nights. To I would do nights. Okay, right. got it. All right, that's fine. Um, so it's technically, that's actually just, not that bad. They could have had one night of an induction and then two days postpartum. So those three cases all look good. Um, now, why did case number four have a consultation with behavioral health? Uh, it's because of teen pregnancy. Okay. Or psychosocial. We also call it, I mean, um, social worker, psychosocial counseling or behavioral health. That's the reason. I think the um, behavioral is spelled wrong. Um, but I think that behavioral health, when I see that, I think of um, psych versus if you just put social worker. Social worker, okay. Right. Then it would just, that would make more sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. But those... Um, 
three cases all look good. So let's now go remember that, don't forget the 20 weeks here, because this baby was 35, 20, and you have oh, 20 right. weeks Ooh, yeah. gestation. Oh, right. yeah, no yes, that that's, that's an error. Yeah. Okay, good. So I missed that, sorry. Okay. All right, so now you have case five, six, seven, that are all twins. Um, I have to probably specify the presentation and chorionos, uh, uh, amniocity and chorionosity. Do you uh, recommend? Yeah, I, I, yeah, that would be good. I mean, again, you could um, you could put vertex vertex or vertex breach, okay. um, and you could put the chorionosity there. Um, and then that's great. The first, in case number five, you have a vaginal delivery, which is good, and those babies appear to be concordant. Now, what's interesting is that the second one um, has APGARs of seven. Um, so what happened with that? Is there complications with that second baby delivery? Um, no, no, I don't remember anything. I think the baby didn't get one point for color. Um, no, there was no complication. It was just one minute, one minute app core. Okay. And All right. five okay. minutes was nine, so. Good. Okay. Um, so that case number five looks fine. And that, and the second baby stayed in the hospital longer than the first baby. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the second baby maybe had some um, respiratory issues. Was on CPAP for a little bit longer. Then That's you need to add said. that. You need to add that in your second column here. Okay. You could put baby. Right. You could put baby B. Um, baby B with uh, respiratory issues. Right. Okay. You know. Clarify. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then the same thing with case six. One baby staying longer than the other baby. Um, so you want to specify what happened with that other baby. Sure. Okay, then case seven, you have 29-week twins with a profundal abruption, category two, category two tracing, previous CD times one. Now, were you going to allow her to attempt a VBAC? Um, if she desired, well, no, her situation was um, urgent. Uh, she had excessive bleeding and it was category 2 tracing, and her cervix was closed. Uh, okay. so was it category 2 or category 3? It was category 2. Okay. What's the difference between how you manage a category 2 and a category 3? For category 2, you can um, basically um, try uh, conservative management, um, and uh, for ca whereas for category 3, basically, you need a uh, Deliver, you need to deliver the patient um, immediately, sort of. Okay, immediately, sort of? Uh, immediately. Okay, good. Um, In an right. expedited fashion. I agree with the change again. You just put steroids, um, tocolysis for neuroprotection. So you had enough time to give her steroids then? Yes, I had um, almost six hours, five, five to six hours. Five to six hours from when she presented until she when she presented. Okay. Yes. Um, so what made you decide that you did have to do a cesarean delivery? Uh, the amount of uh, bleeding uh, increased um, significantly. And um, I thought the uh, placental abrasion was progressing rapidly. Uh, and I did not think that uh, considering that her cervix was closed and she was not in labor, uh, I did not think that uh, allowing her to deliver vaginally would be safe okay. for the fetuses. All right. So what was your reasoning for initially waiting? Um, initially, uh, she had category 1 tracing and her bleeding was uh, mild. Okay. So my assessment, um, my assessment, I thought we can, um, uh, there is no reason for immediate delivery and um, um, we do have uh, some time to start the steroids uh, for uh, fetal lung maturity and magnesium sulfate for neuroprotection. Okay. All right. 
All right. That case looks okay. Should we move on to the next one, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So case number eight was a preterm under the category of preterm delivery. Um, this patient has preterm labor, placental abruption, and no complications postpartum. So she receives a new sulfate, beta methadone. So again, to be consistent, if we're going to change it, I would change it to steroids. And she had an oh, STD. Okay. And that's a small baby for 32 weeks. Yes. But yet, very good APGARS. And stay in the hospital for 46 days. That's a long time. Right. I have to double check my length of stays in the hospital. I do have to do that. Um, some of them could be a little bit inaccurate. Yeah, because that's over a month. OK. Yeah. Um, all right, then moving on to the next cases you have. You make um, sure you put in, cat in the second column here, if the baby is staying for over a month, you want to put in delivery, or that's a postpartum complication, or post, you know, it's a post-delivery with the baby, so you want to write in here what was the issue. Because okay. they're going to ask you, they could ask you about that. So sure. just to be complete. Definitely. Okay. All right, so for labor abnormalities, you have um, the rest, yeah, the first one is arrested dilation, and the second two are arrested descent. Um, are any of them inductions? Um, no. Okay. Um, yeah, no. Uh, they were, they also present in labor. Okay. Um, so the first is arrested dilation. And did you give, for case number nine, did you give her Pitocin? Yes. Okay. So under your column, I would put Pitocin augmentation. Under treatment, right? Correct. And then Before CD. Uh, okay. All right, and that's a decently big baby, so that's good. Then the next one, uh, gestational diabetes, arrest and descent. And then um, if you write glide, um, do you mean glibrad for the next one? Yes, I have to. For some reason, I thought this is my mistake. I wanted to be consistent and put the generic names on it, but actually this is the trade name, so I have to change that. For some reason, I thought this was a generic name, but okay. So she failed So she failed dietary control and then had glyburide. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, I I put I might just put um, diabetic management and let them okay. ask you what you okay. did, how you worked it up, did you try diet first, then did you have to give medication, what medications would you give? Okay. Yeah. Um, should, I, should I add antenatal, t uh, antenatal testing for any case that it applies? Um, you could. You could. But you know what? By definition, it's not an operative procedure or a treatment. Um, antenatal testing is not a treatment or a procedure. Mm -hmm. right. so you yeah. you want to follow what they say here, right? Okay. Okay. Um, and it would also fall under the umbrella of diabetic management. I, okay, I, got, it. got it. Do you agree, Dr. McSherry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the next one with chronic hypertension, um, I generally tell candidates, and Dr. McSherry, tell me if you tell people differently, mm -hmm. I want that chronic hypertension addressed in the treatment column during that, so that, that it indicates that there was a workup for chronic for their chronic hypertension while they were pregnant. So, okay. um, how do you tend to tell people to address that? Or I don't. I just put down the medications that they were on. Let the board ask you. Well, tell me how you work up your patients and what's the definition of chronic hypertension. Don't worry. He'll get a question. He'll get a question on that. Obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. So. So you actually write out. You would write out labetal, all things like that. You no, know, I would I would just put like beta blocker or um, because that's a treatment, you know. Right. Uh huh. Or you or what about if you just put hypertensive management? Oh, uh, you could do that. I mean, what is the you know what is your hypertensive management? I mean, they would ask. Um, you know, that's kind of like a an all and 
one big thing to hypertensive management is not really like diabetic management's fine, but you know what did they mean? What does he mean by hypertensive management? You know, did they give her? So I don't I don't know I I, I guess that's fine. You could do that. I've never heard that uh, written that way before, but I guess you could just. Well, what do you tell people to say? I just tell them to put what medications was she on when she was in labor? You know. Or in labor or while she was pregnant? Well, while she was in the hospital. I mean, this is all about that patient in the hospital with this case, you know. Right. Was she on anything? Would, was she given any medications while she was in the hospital? That's what I would um, address right. here. But, I mean, uh, there's there's so many different ways to skin a cat. Right. So, exactly. I mean, you could do it any, any way you want, pretty much. Right. And I think that you bring up a good point, that they're going to ask you, what is your workup? What testing would you do? Mm -hmm. um, and we're not, we don't want to go into that on this webinar, right? No, that's, that's going to be reserved for when we do um, our case list, um, mock orals, and so okay. on. Yeah. Tonight's right. just pretty much just go over the case list and, and, you know, whether or not there's inconsistencies and uh, typos and things are not listed in the right column and just try to... Okay. Good. So then, and then that baby's really big, 44, 80 grams. It's very big, which is interesting for chronic hypertensive because normally you think that they have small babies. babies. Okay. So then we have hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So case 13, mild preeclampsia, none, SVD, that looks good. Second one, chronic hypertension, previous CD times three. Um, CD and BTL, which is good. Now, however you're going to talk about the chronic hypertensive in 11, you want to do the same thing in terms same of thing. the treatment column. Um, 14, severe preeclampsia, non-magnesium sulfate, SVD. So this is an induction, right? Okay. So case 14 was an induction? Yes, induction for uh, okay. preeclampsia. So I would put, before putting magnesium sulfate, I would put um, induction of labor. Yeah, induction. Okay. Just put induction. You don't have to put induction of labor. Okay, induction. I'm not going to ask you what you use. Uh, should I um, should I change uh, severe preeclampsia to preeclampsia with severe features? Use the new terminology that. I would just are... I would just put preeclampsia and let them yeah. ask you. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, okay, case 15. Gestational hypertension, teen pregnancy, um, and then again, constitutional or behavioral health is fine, or you could just put social services, whatever social you're going to put for that in the beginning, okay. just to keep it consistent. Um, case 16, same thing, you should put preeclampsia, teen pregnancy, so that would be the same way to handle that one. Help syndrome, that's great, let them ask you about what help syndrome is, and then she's 29 weeks, so... Beta methadone, magnesium protection, I mean, uh, magnesium sulfate, and then induction of labor, I would assume, right? Oh, no. um, or you just sectioned her? Yeah, but I just sectioned her because, again, her clinical situation uh, was worsening dramatically and very fast. Um, and she was okay. removed from the delivery. Okay. So, how about HELP syndrome remote from delivery? Remote from the paper, okay. What do you think about that, Dr. Mishai? It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Right, and the need to add why the baby was in the hospital for 57 days. Right, okay. You could put, uh, you could put neonatal uh, prematurity. Severe uh, prematurity. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. All right, so then let's go on to case 18, which is third trimester fetal loss. So you have a, so antepartum, you have demise. So it was an inner uterine fetal demise? Yes. Okay. Um, all right, so you just, I, I would like to see inner uterine fetal demise, so you could probably just leave it as demise. And then... Postpartum, normal karyotype. So everything was normal. She had cord, uh, cord stricture on pathological exam of the placenta and cord. 
Okay. Um, that all should go in the treatment column, right? That's well, then again, it, this is this is not a tr an examination. Um, I mean, that uh, lab tests. I wouldn't even add that because that's not a treatment or an operative procedure. So um, there really is no really. I mean, you have your time on your office list to add all your diagnostic tests, but on the OB list. They will ask you what the work, they don't care about this patient. They're just going to ask you what the workup for an IUFD is. Okay. So I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even put that. There's no reason because they're not, they don't ask specific things to a case. They're going to say, well, um, I see you have an IUFD here. Can you explain to me what the workup is? Okay. You know? Should I just cut it down and uh, just put pathological exam code stricture? Just to be yeah, you could do that. Right. You could do uh, pathology cord stricture. That's a finding. You could do that, okay. and then um, all the other stuff. Just I would leave. The, I would omit that, and then okay, okay, and then the treatment was an S. Did you induce her? Um, yes. Okay. Well, then you'd have to do intrauterine fetal demise, and then for treatment it would be induction, and then SVD. Okay. And that's again uh, diabetic uh, care for the diabetic patients instead of diet modification. I... Yeah, diabetic care. Okay. Sorry. Good. So that would cover our case 19. Then case 20, just same thing. Case 21. Um, I would also change 21 to diabetic management. Sure. And with also hypertensive management. Or you could put what medications they were on. Um, case 22 is great because they have a shoulder dystocia. Instead of writing out the maneuvers, I would write out shoulder dystocia maneuvers. Okay. The diabetic management, um, shoulder dystocia maneuvers. And then it's not an SVD if they have it's vaginal delivery, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, 23, same thing as we said before. 24, also take out the uh, the trade name. Good. Okay. Um, so let's scroll down to case 25. Did she have twins yeah. before? What's the gravidinine paranine? Is that correct? No, I, yeah, I think it's inaccurate. Okay. All right, so 25, we have, oh, so she had retinopathy, neuropathy with this pregnancy? Uh, yes, so basically this was class R, F, but I don't know if I should put that really, I mean, or let them ask if, I, if it comes up. I mean, the only point was that that's why she had IUGR, basically, because she had um, vascular. Yeah. Um, Damage. Sequel. You could, yeah, you could put pre-gestational diabetes. You could put class R diabetes. Okay. The red, and then severe preeclampsia, there. And then mm -hmm. have your treatment column yeah, follow the same format. Good. Um, so it's interesting. Case twenty-six. You have a macrosomic baby, and then you have a vaginal delivery. So. And this category is what? This category is a diabetes category? Abnormal uh, yeah. growth. Oh, I see. So the first one is IUGR and the second one is, yeah, that's actually a really small baby in case 25. Yes. Um, so you knew she was macrosomic from an estimated fetal weight on ultrasound, right? Yes. So, so it Dr. McCray, probably was... Suspected macrosomia or writing macrosomia? You can just, that's fine. You can put macrosomia there. I mean, if... Or if, sus suspected macrosomia? Well, I mean, if you if you knew it was macrosomic based on your Leopold's maneuvers and the ultrasound and um, you went ahead and did a vaginal delivery, I mean, if that kid was got stuck, I mean, right. what would they have right. said to you? Well, so, but if she 
not a diabetic and it's 4599 grams, theoretically, you do have a leg to stand on because she's, you're asking me to do it with less than 5,000. Mm -hmm. Um, it would just be a matter of you would tell them that you counsel the patient of the risk of children's dystocia and that she was aware and consented for a trial of labor. Okay. Moving oh, you off. could put growth greater than the 90th percentile. That's another slippery way of writing it. Or you could put uh, size greater than dates. Okay. No. There's it, a lot of different ways. Did you induce this patient or she came in an active labor? No, she came in labor. Okay, good. All right, so the next one is pulsatile abruption category 3 tracing. Wow, if one that I've got was one? Yes, this was, she almost had like sino, she, she had sinusoidal pattern you know, tracing again. Um, All right, do you usually see sinusoidal with a pulsatile abruption? If it's um, advanced enough and the amount of bleeding or retroplacental bleeding is already uh, significant, I think we can. Okay. Well, I find it hard because to believe basically, that. Uh, if the patient was so anemic that it's causing you to have a sinusoidal tracing and to have an APGAR of 1, that your 5-minute APGAR is going to be 8. Right? It's a little yes, hard sir. to justify. What do you think about that? Um, I would put the 10-minute APGAR here. Uh, maybe the kid oh, okay. had a difficult delivery. I don't know, whatever the issue is. But just add your, if this is what it, this is what it was, I mean, it is what it is. So right. I would just put the 10-minute APGAR in this. Instead of putting none here, I'd put the 10-minute APGAR. Yeah. But I don't think that your 1-minute APGAR of 1 is explained by the fetal anemia because you wouldn't see that type of etiology then rectifying itself so quickly. Correct. So right. in preparing to uh, present this case, you, I think you need to figure out why it was an APGAR of one. Okay. Did the baby Probably. stay in the hospital extra days or anything? It looks like it was discharged on the third day. Yeah, no, the gases were good. There was oh, no... Okay. CDMO. You could write, you could, maybe, the, I don't know what's going on with that one minute, but maybe you could put uh, what the base, base excess normal, mm -hmm. right? or um, you could put the pH, whatever the pH was, if you want to, you know, qualify that the baby was fine. Okay. Um, that's just an option. You don't have to do that, but it's just an option. Case 28 is actually a really good example of why you might have a poor APGAR, though 7 is not a poor APGAR. Because when you, have, when you do have that cord prolapse at one minute, you could likely see a low APGAR because it's an acute injury. And then right. five minute APGAR might be more normalized. So case 28 is good. Um, case two, category two tracing, true knot, SVD. Looks good. That looks fine. Um, and then you have VBAX. Good. So you have. That's are. another choreo here that could oh. go under with, uh, but this is also SVD, never mind. Right, exactly. So she actually, um, don't, don't write SVD, actually write VBAC. So antibiotics and then VBAC. Okay. Um, yeah. And then the next, okay, third degree laceration, fine. Um, an SCD, that's good. Um, and 33 is a good example of having a placental abruption but not having to do a C-section because apparently she was close to delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and I like the fact that you have case 34 with two previous C-sections because it brings up the new guidelines saying that um, there is a role for doing a VBAC or a trial of labor after two C-sections. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. So those are fine. Um, then 35, 36, and then just can you scroll down to 37? Yep. Okay. So these are all one previous C-section. So we have preterm labor, fine. Um, prom with preterm labor, 
small baby, well, 33 weeks up to, okay. Um, arrested dilation. I like how you were unsuccessfully VBAC. Should I change uh, the category uh, to C-section? Um, because technically this was not a VBAC, it did. Um, well, it was an unsuccessful TOLAC, mm -hmm. but you don't have to put it in that column because that column is for things that happen after 10 centimeters, okay. and this happened prior to 10 centimeters. So you could actually put none mm -hmm. in that column, and then you okay. could put VPCD in the um, treatment column. Okay. Um, so 36 is a vacuum, case 39 looks fine also, and then again, just put behavior, mm -hmm. leave health or do whatever, it's consistent. Um, case 40, prolonged second stage, maternal exhaustion, needed a vacuum, good. Um, and same thing, case 41, good. Yeah, what's, do you have any GYN cases here? Yeah, it's, uh, it follows. Okay. Yeah, right, let's do the, like, the first two pages of his GYN list. Right here. Okay. It's a lot of stuff here, so. Good. Okay. Um, so let's do abdominal hysterectomy there. So you're 47-year-old, she has abnormal uterine bleeding anemia. All right, so you have um, a lot of details in terms mm -hmm. of what you did. You did. Mm -hmm. So you could put, you could put uh, so uh, scroll up to the other, so I can do a comment. All right, this is for treatment. Okay. Um, so I would put unsuccessful medical management mm -hmm. in the first column. I will put everything actually except for hysteroscopy DNC. Okay. <clears throat> oh, actually, no, I have, except for TAH, I would put in the diagnosis column, and then the treatment is just TAH. And you left your ovaries in place, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Do you agree, Dr. Mashai, to put everything um, in there? You know, this I is a lot of information. They really don't care about this patient. All they're going to want to know is how do you work up or how do you manage a patient with abnormal. And we know why she's in the operating room, because she's having surgery, obviously. So when she's under abdominal hysterectomy. So do you need to put down every medication she was on? I think that's unnecessary. It just adds more information to your case list than you really need, because they will ask you, again, what the, the management is or how, how do you, you know, manage a particular patient and that will be also addressed in your office case list too. So right. what I would put, how I would do the abnormal uterine bleeding, anemia, lyomyoma, and then if you want you can do unsuccessful uh, medical management and um, you can put lyomyoma 16 week size uterus. I mean you can do that if you want to keep in your sonogram findings but you don't need to add here Whatever you put on your operative note as your preoperative or admission diagnosis for this hospital admission, that actually should be in that column right there. You know, okay. I'm sure you did put in lyomyoma because that's what one of the diagnoses you received before you took her to the OR, correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. So right. you could put lyomyoma, abnormal uterine bleeding, um, anemia, that's fine, and... Um, she did have she, transfusion, so that's fine. You did put it over there. That's correct. And um, I would put uh, TAH and then um, put um, adhesional lysis. Okay. Yes. Okay, because the peritoneal adhesions, that really is not a complication. That was just a incidental finding, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah, so, and then surgical pathology, I, uterine weight, that's fine. Lyomyoma, that's fine. Adenomyosis is fine, and then you could put pelvic adhesive disease in that column. Okay. Okay. So do you, th uh, you think sonogram findings and the sizes are not necessary? Only for adnexal masses that's necessary. Okay, okay. 
for leiomyomas, it really doesn't matter. I mean, it could be, um, you know, a 9 or, you know, 40 week size uterus or, you know, a 16 week size uterus. You're still going to pretty much manage it the same way you're going to do a hysterectomy on her. Right. Now, how you take the uterus out may change because a 16 weeker you could try and do vaginally or laparoscopic assisted, whereas a, you know, 40 week size uterus is going to have to come out, you know, through an abdominal incision unless you're really trained in laparoscopy, which. I don't think anybody can do that, but it's it's the same, you know, overall, it's, um, she's she's being brought to the OR, you know, because of her uterus, so, um, so anyway, that's my little comment on that. Okay. And I would follow the same <coughs> format for case number two. Sure. <coughs> so you can just put on the successful med medical management. Okay. And your treatment column is going to be your vaginal hysterectomy, and then your pathology column is correct, and no complications. But right, so let's move on to <coughs> case number three. So this one at top, let's put a dimension for the ovarian cyst. Yeah, that's where you have to put it here. You want to put, I would just put seven centimeters. Okay. Seven cm. Okay. And then in the next column, you can take out that sonogram and just put laparoscopic cystectomy. Okay. And yeah, they don't nice. usually, the pathology wouldn't usually say benign cysts, right? They might say benign cyst wall or. Uh, should I specify like. Cyst adenoma or sure. If that's what it was, yeah, you can put down the exact pathology, or if it was a follicular cyst, or if it was a corpus luteum. But hopefully, you didn't do that. But you took out there was an endometrioma. I think um, endometrioma is just fine. You can just leave that at okay. that. You know, I don't think you need to go into detail on you know physiological cysts if they were there. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right, and then the next one, all right, so now she's pregnant and has a cyst. She's a laparoscopic cystectomy. And put what kind of cyst it was. Hopefully you didn't take out her corpus luteum. No, no, I didn't. It was a, I think it was a serous cyst adenoma. Okay, good. Yeah. Okay. And right. so you want to, this is fine, make sure you spell pregnancy correct. You know, um, and oh, we, yes. yeah, and then pelvic pain's fine, and then um, I would put adnexal mass eleven centimeters. Okay. You know, just put or um, they put adnexal mass. That's why I like to list these because that technically that's what they are. It's a mass. Right. You don't know, really know what it is. You're, you're pretty sure it could mm -hmm. be um, assists of some sort. So. You know, either it's hyperechoic or hypoechoic, depending on, you know, what the, if it's fluid or if it's solid, but. Okay, well, we're going to stop there, and we're going to move on to the next candidate, because it's already 842. Um, but your list overall looks good. Thank you. You did a nice job on it. I mean, I would like to take a look at your office list. Um, maybe we'll just, just do one page of his office, Brooke, just so we're complete okay. here. Um, sure. I don't want to miss something, and then, then let's go to your office real quick. And there we go. I'm going to just do this first page, and then we'll move on to the next candidate. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So preventative care. Um, let's just specify where that high-grade lesion was. Um, so your that high-grade lesion actually should go... Because that's on papa smear, so. Yeah. Right. Well, was she referred to you from another practitioner, or? Uh, no, uh, I did a Velvoman exam, and I did a papa smear, and the result came out high grade. Okay, so this this was found out after the fact, right? Y yes. Okay, so I would do age-appropriate screening, and then I would put um, cytology high grade. Okay, got it. Okay. 
And, and with the treatment, then you would put underneath that, you could put colposcopy, CIN2. But I would actually put this patient in your, um, where you have abnormal cytology. I wouldn't put her here. This is a, this is a, this is a, a category for somebody who just comes in for an annual and they're fine. There's nothing really going on, right? Okay. Right. So for the same reasons, I would put case number two. Same thing, yeah. Osteoporosis. Yeah, your preventative health care, what you want to do is you want to put somebody at a really young age and somebody at a really old age. So this is actually a pretty good range right here, 24 and 57. I would actually put 24, maybe somebody over 65, actually. And then well woman exam is fine. Um, and then you put uh, for your second column, age appropriate screening is fine. I would just leave it at that. And then uh, your treatment would be um, uh, discussion of health care maintenance, or you could just put uh, age appropriate counseling. I mean, that's fine too. And then ongoing care would be your your results. Um, if you want to, if the results are all negative, you don't need to add anything to this column. If the results came back were her TSH, for instance, let's say uh, she was over the age of 50 and you did a TSH and it came back um, elevated. You know, she's got hypothyroidism, then you could put that in that column. But here is, this is a perfect example of where you want to put a patient that doesn't really have any complication, just comes in for annual and she, and she has her labs and her pap and everything was fine. Okay. Okay. Now make it complicated for yourself. Okay. Okay. Sure. Same thing with uh, case, case number, number two, you know, yeah. same thing. Case number three was sexual dysfunction. I would put history and physical exam because obviously sexual dysfunction has a lot to do with their history. Um, or you're going to get a lot of information from the history. And then treatment will be the estrogen cream and then um, improved dyspareunia, ongoing care. Looks good. I would put E2 here. Just put E2, estrogen. That's okay. the, the um, short hand for estrogen that's approved by the board, so you don't have to write this whole thing out here. I see. Okay. Remember, with the case list, um, less is more. So the less you put on here, the easier it's going to read for the examiner, and I think your exam will go a lot more smooth. It will be very smooth, your exam, because then they're like, well, what does this mean, or what does this mean? It's just very straightforward and to the point. And again, less is more on your case list. So, and go ahead, Brooke. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, case four is a. It's good. I would just be wary of having a 19-year-old with an IUD. Um, mm -hmm. It's fine, and obviously, you could talk about how the ACOG now Counseling. doing IUDs and primips, but. She's not the greatest example. I might make someone. I might pick someone that's a little older with an IUD. Okay. Um, and but otherwise that looks fine. And then um, case five gets a uh, gets depo because you have a history of DVT, um, which is fine. You know, there's so people that debate even giving progesterone to people with coagulopathies. So it's a little bit controversial, but that one might be a great candidate for the copper IED. Mm -hmm. Yes. But otherwise, it's written well. Uh, and then genetic, genetic counseling looks fine. Well, woman, breast cancer, and two siblings. Um, so yeah. they just put genetic counseling and... Yeah. I would put, his, you mean in terms of the second column, I might just put history and physical and then genetic counseling. Because um, okay. it's a little... Too much. Yeah. 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 Okay. And then um, you have mammogram, breast MRI. I would just put breast imaging. Okay. You can put, you can, so she has, she does have a BRCA2 mutation. mutation then, by yes. definition. So I would put um, genetic counseling uh, positive for BRCA2. Okay. Make it simple. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. You know, and um, 
there you go. You've got mammogram, breast. This is fine. Um, these are all the tests that you did. So um, I would probably um, put them under diagnostic procedures, you know, because these are, by definition, diagnostic procedures. Right? Okay. Right? Yeah, so they fine. would go in column two. Right. This would all go in column two. It's fine. You can list these. These are fine. Okay, so we'll actually stop here, and overall, your list looks good. I mean, you're doing a really, really good job um, putting it together and staying on top of it. When did you start um, constructing your list? How long ago? Um, like three months ago. Good, excellent. And you're adding your cases how often? Every week or every month? Yeah, re uh, yeah on a regular basis. Good, excellent. And do you have your software on your laptop? You just bring it to the office with you, or...? I have it on uh, three flash drives everywhere I go. <laughs> I oh, well, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> good for yeah, because I don't want my flash drives crash on me. And, That's know. smart. Yeah, you don't want that to happen, and then the whole thing crash, and then it's like, yeah. where is my case list? And then you have a nervous exactly. breakdown. You don't want that to happen. <laughs> okay, well, you did a great job, and keep up the good work. We'll look forward to seeing it again, hopefully, in July, right? Yes, thank you okay. so much. I appreciate it. No problem. Okay, and now Emily is next, so I'm going to take Emily off of mute. I'll pull her case list up. Hi, Emily. Are you there? I'll give her a second to respond. Okay. Emily, are you present? I don't hear her, so. Um, Brooke? What you can do is just start making some comments on her list, and maybe she's working on getting her um, her you know audio working. Okay. Um, so her first category is complications of C-section. So did she make up her own categories here? No, this is actually um, this is the uh, Exam Pro um, I think software. So it's listed a little bit differently. Okay. Um, so 24-year-old GTP1 at 39 weeks, chronic hypertension, arrested dilation. So that should go in the first column, the arrested dilation. And then wound infection would be the only thing in, the, in that column. Yeah. This actually has to go over here. Right. And the induction and actually goes over here. And the wound infection is not coming. failed. They just put induction of labor. Right. By CD antibiotic. So it should say chronic hypertension, arrestive dilation, then the next column, wound infection, and then the last column, induction of labor, primary, CD antibiotics. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, case three, delivery complications. Okay, so she's a 20-year-old 20, 20 private at 40 weeks, has TREC, group B strep positive, and she has a shoulder socia and anemia. So she gets antibiotics for her TREC. Um, now, would you say to leave the TREC out because of the fact that it's not something that's going on while she is in labor? Um, well, I mean, if she came to the hospital when she had trichomoniasis, I think that would be appropriate. But if it was something that happened um, during her, you know, entire prenatal course, I don't know how important it is to list it here. I think if, if she came into the hospital and she had trichomoniasis and you diagnosed it while she was there, and gave her antibiotics right. for it on this hospital admission, then there's a reason to put it on the list. But um, if she's not, then I would just go along with the GBS here. And, um, right. and no matter, I mean, if she has trick, it's not going to change her management anyway. So no. um, it's and not important. And you're talking about her shoulder social, which the trick has nothing to do with it. Yeah, exactly. So, all right, so shoulder social anemia. And again, the anemia is only pertinent if she bled so much during the delivery that it caused her to be anemic. Yeah, and then also she's augmented this patient. Why was she augmented? You know. 
Right. So then we need to address that arrest mm -hmm. violation or um, protracted labor or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is she there? No? Um, I, I don't hear her. I don't know if she doesn't have a headset or um, maybe she doesn't have a microphone. I told her to call in, though, so. All right, um, all right so let's move on to the next one. So this is fetal heart rate abnormalities. I'd like to see what category it was. And apparently, all right, so again, as just to review for everyone, the first column is everything that happens up to 10 centimeters. The second column is 10 centimeters on. So if she had her C-section, during the first stage of labor, then, um, then we need to have that fetal intolerance of labor in that first column and arrested dilatation in that first column. So group B strep positive, depression, post date, category two or three tracing, arrested Hello? dilation. Oh, she's here. What did you do, oh, Emily? I, I, I pulled it out and I... <laughs> I reinserted it. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Okay, good. Now here she now here she is. Yay! Good. I'm glad. Okay, Brooke, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay, so we were just saying, Emily, that first column is everything up to ten centimeters. So okay. all the arrestive dilatations, they all go in that first column. And mm -hmm. so for case number four, it should be group E strep positive, depression, post dates, arrestive dilatation, fetal intolerance of labor or you could actually put the category. And then that next column, it's probably none, right? She didn't have any complications no. after she was delivered. And mm -hmm. then the third column would be, I would put induction first before the antibiotics, just to keep it in chronological order. So induction, antibiotics, primary CV. OK. All right. Um, and you did you hear what we said about the other cases? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Um, case five has hypothyroid, no prop, none for delivery. Um, you could put, we could list the medication, or you could just say thyroid medication. STD looks good. Um, case six, gestational thrombocytopenia, prior CD, decline Z back. Um, okay, and then none, and then repeat CD. 39 weeks is good. And then key 7 is anemia, asymptomatic bacteria, bacteriuria, the chance of meconium. Is that, should I leave the meconium out? Um, well, it doesn't really look like it. But how is this a hematologic or endocrine disease? Um, she had anemic antepartum. This uh, take, um, I, I mean, what do you think about that, Dr. Michelle? I mean, how anemic was she? Was she uh, below, I mean, was she below 11? Yes, yeah. Uh, what was so, I, so our, our, my treatment during her uh, prenatal care was uh, ferrous sulfate. Okay. And a lot of people are anemic because of the hemodilutional effect. Right. Um, but for someone that's going to go under that category, I'd like to see them anemic because they have a hemoglobinopathy or sickle oh, okay. cell disease or something like that. Oh, got it. Okay. Okay. So I'll just put her as an uncategorized then, I guess. Well, you, you can you know, you could put her there or um, asymptomatic bacteria. When was that diagnosed? During her pregnancy. It's all just prenatal. Okay, if, if this is all prenatal, then really you don't need to address it. This is the you're, you're addressing issues with the, the diagnosis was when she came into the hospital. Okay. So the right. anemia actually is valid. I mean, you could keep that there just to fill up that column. That's fine. But you've got a gestational thrombocytopenia for hematological diseases, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you really need that in there. Um, it's up to you. I mean, the aseptic. A asymptomatic bacteria. I mean, did you give her antibiotics while she was in labor? Uh, no. Okay, then that doesn't need to be listed here. Okay. 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 Well, I, okay. Yeah. For treat. This is only for treatments for this hospital admission. Got okay. it. Okay. Okay. 
So I guess it's the same thing for this. I was, um, I didn't, I didn't understand. So I'll take her. I'll take patient eight out. Well, it's it's not a lack of understanding. I mean, she theoretically has a hematologic disease, so <laughs> you could leave it in. You but could it leave was it. At, I mean, okay. <laughs> yeah, and then. They'll ask you. They'll ask you about any type of anemia they want. I mean, they're not going to ask you specifically this case. They're going to say um, you may want to put iron deficiency anemia, mm -hmm. or normal acidic anemia, or whatever anemia she had to be a little bit more specific. And then they may gear the question towards that. But and then again, they may ask you what's the difference between megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic, you know, anemia. They may ask you that. So okay. okay. All right, should we go on to the GM? Yep. Go ahead. Yep. Right. So case number nine, go ahead, Brooke. For the oh, you don't want to go on to GYM? Oh, you want to go to GYM? Yeah, we can go to GYM. I'm sorry. It's because we're only going till nine, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's just... Well, we actually we can go to, to 9.15 because we went 15 minutes over with the first person. Okay. So... Um, Let's go here to her GYN list. We'll do this for 15, and then we'll do the next one for 15. Um, you mean like, well, are we going to end our webinar at 9.15? 9.15, yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so you have an abdominal hysterectomy for 38-year-old GYMP1, menorrhagia, fibroid. Okay. Um, so you don't want to mention the fibroid from ultrasound? You're telling you're not. Oh, what do Dr. you mean? Mishari? No, Dr. Mishari, what are you telling people about dimensions of the fibroids? Not to no, them? just put, just put. Um, I would put lyomyoma instead of fibroid. I mean, that's what okay. the patients tell you. I just put menomenorrhagia, a lyomyoma, or lyomyomatous uterus. You can put that. Okay. And then total laparoscopic hysterectomy is fine. And then... I like to say the uterine weights first. I mean, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You, they say to list it first, but, I mean, as long as it's in this column, that's fine. I mean, you don't have to yeah. change everything around just because it's listed last. It's just the way that this software works. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. Oh, uh, okay. Um, good. So that looks fine. Um, the next one, pelvic pain, uterine lyomyoma, so she had a robotic hysterectomy, BSO, be prepared to talk about taking out healthy ovaries. Okay. Because they were. Um, and then you have a cystoscopy, which just invites the question of, do you always do a cystoscopy? Do you always do a cystoscopy? Um, Should I just leave that out? Since I mean, I do always do a cystoscopy for my robots. Uh -huh. um, but should I leave the cystoscopy out? No, just leave it there. Put it, I wouldn't oh, okay. put robotic. I would just put total laparoscopic hysterectomy. Okay. BSO and then cystoscopy. And and if they ask you why you did a cystoscopy, then you can explain to them. Oh, okay. Okay. Yep. Good. That looks fine. Case three. All right. So this one is. I like to see it say cytology or PAP. Oh, it, well, let, me, let me address it because you didn't address this book. Why did you take her ovaries out? Oh, uh, because, of, be because of the pelvic pain, and I, I warned her that there might be a risk of reoperation oh, um, if I don't take them out. And so she opted to just take them out. Okay. All right. That's fine. Okay. The next one, I like to see it say for clarity, either PAP ASCUS or cytology ASCUS, and then colposcopic biopsy, colon, CAN3, which is big. It's a discrepancy, actually. And then she had a leap. Um, and you have involvement of the extracervical margin. So it just asks the question, the question of how are you going to proceed from here? What are you going to do now? I'm just going to be repeating her um, PAP and COLPO. So I should put on, I don't know where to put ongoing care. Uh, I don't think you have to. 
Okay. Don't, okay. This is not the office list. You don't need to do that. Okay. 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 So case four, 46-year-old G4P2. All right. So you want to have the gravity. Do you, you tell everyone that it should be a 4-4 four, four, even if they've had abortions? Dr. Well, Bouchard? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So leave that one. So she has menorrhagia, fibroids, endometrial biopsy, inadequate. Um, so I would just either put in a, so I would just write inadequate endometrial biopsy. Um, in addition to the other things, but I would move inadequate to the beginning of that. Okay. And so she had a hysteroscopy DNC, and then it looks like you only if you had squamous and endocervical mucosa. It looks like maybe you didn't get uterine tissue. Yes, I didn't. I did not. So um, this lady is actually still ongoing treatment for her, and my plan is to, because um, I've done endometrial biopsy two or three times in the office and then this, and I think she just has so much fibroids that it's um, compressing everything, and it's making it hard for me to get in there. So she, she's for a hist some time, and I was just going to do a frozen uh -huh. on, on the specimen and go from there. Because I couldn't okay, get it. You know, again, we're not gonna we're not doing mock orals tonight. But if you're gonna okay. do frozen, um, do you have an oncologist available? Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. So you have the oncologist on standby, and then you. Yeah. Do okay. It. Yeah. All right. Um, now, did you know prior to getting your pass back that you didn't have any endometrial tissue? No. I I talked with a pathologist, and I showed him pictures that I was in the cavity because <laughs> I took, you know, I did a hysteroscopy and, and he took a look at the report again and he said that he could not find any. So it's this big um, enigma, really. Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Um, so a little frustrating. Right. So in you were saying that the thought was that she had fibroids, so you weren't getting inside. But when they yes. have right in front of them, they did a hysteroscopy, then theoretically you should be aware of whether you or not you got inside. And then you go on to further say you have pictures of being inside. So it's a yeah. little bit, I feel like that, this case and the description of it, take away your credibility a little bit. Okay. Because it's almost a little too passive to say, oh, well, I guess I just didn't get inside, but yeah, I have pictures when I was inside. So, um, again. Would you recommend me saying that I would repeat the hysteroscopy? <laughs> well, so repeating the hysteroscopy is going to be a lot potentially more, it's more invasive than repeating yeah. the biopsy. So, or try to repeat sampling. Right. So I would say that um, well, maybe give cytotech, you know, give her cytotech, and maybe that will help you pass it a little bit. If the cervix is a little bit softer, you may, you know, she have pictures that she was inside. Of yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe the pathologist, you know, who knows? Did, how many specimen cups did they take? Did they when they sent it to the lab? I mean, oh, just maybe one. The, okay. So you don't so put I, the you don't put the endocervical um, scraping ECC separate from the endometrial. No. no, I don't. Okay. No. So I, I guess I could. Just, when you do uh, when you put the endocervical separate from the endometrial, do you know what that's called? Separate, like the ECC. Yeah. I, no. I, that's a fractional ECC, which. Oh, okay. Isn't something that we do anymore. Okay, good. Um, see, well, the reason why I ask that is because in a case like this where you know your biopsy was inadequate and um, I don't know, how did you take your specimen? Did you take it in with a curette when you were... Yes. And there was, mm -hmm. no, and there was nothing on a curette? There, there, there was tissue there, but apparently it's just, I was just in the cervix. Either she has a really long cervix, and when I get my curette in there, I was hitting a, a fibroid or what. So I... Yeah. <laughs> right. See, the, the other thing you could have used um, a hysteroscopy, a sleeve where 
there is that little uh, wire that you feed through um, that you can actually see where you grasp a piece of tissue. You know, you could, okay. you could have used that, um, and then you would have been rest assured that you did take a little piece of tissue from the endometrial wall. Um, right. At that time, may... I did not even know that I was not inside. Right. Okay. It, it, would, it was, even in the office, she was sounding, you know, nine centimeters each time. Okay. So I don't know. She has yeah. a long cervix. Okay. All right. But that's, these are some things that they could, I, I doubt they're going to ask you, but they could. You know, they probably you will. Be, <laughs> And you just got to be prepared mentally for that kind of questioning. So, okay, okay we're going to go to her. Oh, finish up her last two cases, Brooke, and then we'll go to her office. Well, let me just say um, that I think if they were going to take you down a path, right. this case, the question path and advice is, what are you going to do from now on? What do you do in patients right. where you have an inadequate sample? Because um, I think it's a little tricky. Yeah. Okay. Their whole goal is to know that you're safe out there and that people are being effectively worked up. Um, all right, so your last few cases are just um, missed abortion and then bladed ovum. And as you know, there's a new practice bulletin about the medical management of abortion, which right. is more geared towards um, induced abortion. Elective. Mm -hmm. But um, brings up a good point about how to manage, manage them medically. Okay, and just for a reminder, um, in your in your surgical pathology, um, on your surgical pathology, if you don't have any pathology, then you just put your final clinical diagnosis in this column. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So whatever your post-operative diagnosis was, if you have no clinical pathology or any pathology report, put your final clinical diagnosis in this box right here. Okay. That's what, it says Thank the, you. that's what it says in the bulletin. Okay. Well, good. All right. So let's move on to office. Office. Yeah. Let me go move down to office. And here we go. Okay. All right. So we have abnormal unit of bleeding, but not in pelvic masses. Breast disease. Let's do. All right, let's do case five. Um, so she's 23, lactational breast and nipple pain. And she turns out to have yeast infection or it's rush. Mm -hmm. um, for the third column, <clears throat> I would put I would put antifungal treatment comma topical. I would just put topical antifungal or just antifungal in general. Um, okay. And then it also invites the question of how is the baby going to be managed, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, then you have a fibroadenoma, so she, she comes with a breast lump, surveillance, ongoing care. Um, some people recommend removing that fibroadenoma, so I would just be well-versed in management of fibroadenoma. Good. Okay. Um, case 7. Family planning, so she has a history of physical, negative pregnancy test, and she gets um, Dimple Provera. So, uh, good. So, um, we do one, we'll do one more page for her. Okay. okay. All right, that's my perception. Pills, good. Um, okay, push for depression. I'd like it to say antidepressant and then counseling. Okay. Yeah. That's reasonable. And another thing, too, um, this is just an option for people if they haven't started putting their list, list together. Um, putting history and physical examination, um, some people don't even put that. You can go either way. You don't even need to put this. I mean, you could just put your findings on physical exam. You know, um, did you do any diet? Did you do the Edinburgh on her? You could just list, you know, Edinburgh, whatever the, the score was. Um, oh, like depression score. Yeah, you could put that there because um, do you? The the other thing too is on history and physical exam. What some can, and I'm saying you don't want to reinvent the wheel now because you've already got it all, you know, nice and pretty, but. 
um, for a lot of people that are just, you know, seeking how to construct a case list appropriately, there's no, there's really no correct way to skin a cat. I mean, you can do it so many different ways, but you could put down your positive findings on your physical exam here and then your diagnostic test findings. Whatever's positive you want to add here. Don't put everything that you order, just put your positive findings. And then that, then they could say, well, what was the workup? And then you could get into everything. So that's a way to make it, you know, kind of, um, but the, just another option. Okay, go ahead, Brooke. I'm sorry. Okay. So you have eating disorders. Um, so you're listing that as obesity. So she has testing modification. Um, does she have any weight loss? No, not yet. Okay. Um, and I would put dietary modification and then exercise. Then, you know, address exercise also. Or you could put lifestyle, instead of putting dietary lifestyle. Yeah, lifestyle, lifestyle modification. Lifestyle modification. Good. Perfect. Okay, and then you have morbid obesity, menorrhagia. So this one has PCOS picture, but she gets a um, bariatric surgery. And she has an ask is HPV positive pap, so they're theoretically she should get a cold ball. She is um, 23, so I told her that we could do it in one year. Okay. Uh, do you agree with that? Um, yeah, I think that's a reasonable option for case number 13. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess that's okay. I mean, for your, you're going to repeat her testing in one year, is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. Okay, good. Or should we end here since it's nice? Yeah, and then remember, don't put surveillance of mildly, I mean, what's the definition of mild versus moderate versus severe prolactin? I mean, I would just put um, monitor prolactin levels. You could do that. Okay. Okay. And uh, referral for bariatric surgery. Uh, again, mildly elevated. Just put the prolactin level. I mean, if you want to add that and okay. put what her DHEAS level was. That's fine. Okay. And um, ongoing care is reasonable. Body wow, you've got some big patients. Wow, that's crazy. Hercetism. Um, we're not using menomenorrhagia anymore. Remember, it's abnormal uterine bleeding. Okay. Um, right, Brooke? As yes. far as that, yep. yeah. you want to make sure you yeah. use the correct terminology and that you're reading the practice bulletins. Okay. Because that's going to reflect how current you are, and you don't want to reflect that you don't read the um, ACOG guidelines. So okay. that's important for you to, to um, document here. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, Emily, you do actually your list looks very good. It's just minor changes to it overall. I mean, just a little bit of tweaking, but you're doing a really good job. I'm impressed. It's really good. And same thing with the. Did you have you listened to all the webinars? Um. Yes. You have. Wow. Yeah. I mean, at least. It, well, what I'm doing is working for you guys. I mean, the lists are good. I'm just. I'm impressed. I really am. I'm excited. Really excited, so that you guys thank are you on the right much. track. No problem, uh, Brooke. I want to thank you for being here tonight. It kind of helped me out a little bit. I appreciate it on your busy schedule and being here. It's I know it's an hour and a half, a half or fifteen minutes of your time, but thank you. <coughs> All right. All right. Thank you so much. Thank right, you. Bye-bye. Okay, this is Dr. McSherry concluding tonight's webinar. It is nine seventeen p.m. on April twenty-one, two thousand and fourteen. Uh, just a reminder: tomorrow night's uh, presentations on gestational diabetes with Dr. Walton and Dr. Patrick. So I'll look forward to seeing you all um, here. The uh, new, new schedule was sent out, just a preliminary, just to, to give idea to people if they want to volunteer to do presentations. And I did send it out. If you did not receive a copy of the email for the dates for 2014 and topics that are going to be presented, um, please send me an email request. I'll send it out to you, and then I'll know you're not on the email list. It'll give me a little bit more information. Um, we do have two caseless critiques, uh, Wednesday, May 7th, 
and Tuesday, May 20th. We do have 11 webinars um, in the month of May. It's going to get better uh, because once the written courses are over with, in July we're going to go full, blow, uh, full blast. So we'll look forward to um, doing a whole month of caseless construction. So take care. Have a good night. Thank you all for being here, and we'll see you all tomorrow night.